what we were talking about. All right, we're going to go through some scripture here. Um, today's message is part two of I Tell You the Truth. Because last week we went through part one of I Tell You the Truth and we talked about truth. And that's all we did. We went through and looked at the truth and we looked at the deception that Satan tries to get us to believe. And one of the things that we talked about last week is that, you know, to understand truth, um, Jesus always talks about, I tell you the truth. He says it all the time. I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. But the reason he does that is because there obviously is a lot of deception. Or he wouldn't have to keep repeating himself by saying, I tell you the truth. And there's a ton of scriptures on, I tell you the truth. The second thing that we talked about last week that we have to realize is that to learn truth, you must believe there's deception. And, um, you know, just like our guest today said, that there's a ton of deception out there. And there is. There's a ton of deception in the world right now. And we have to be aware of that deception so we can stay clear of it. So that's the reason why God always talks about, I tell you the truth, so we can stay clear of the deception that's going on in the world. The next thing it talks about is that uh, we must learn the truth to believe. And we also have to learn that you can be deceived. Because if you don't believe you can be deceived, you're already deceived. That's a big thing to realize. Right. If you don't believe you can be deceived, then you're already deceived. Because every one of us can be deceived. Right. And so if we think we're walking the straight and narrow, we think we're going in the right direction, we think we're doing the right thing, all we have to do is look at what the Bible says and see if we're actually doing what the Bible says. Because there's one thing to say we do what the Bible says. There's a whole nother thing to actually be doing what the Bible says. And so it's very important for us to understand that. And so let's look at um, the truth number one. Uh, we're going to go through just a few scriptures today, which is Matthew 17. One of the things I just want to let you know is how these messages come about. I don't prepare these messages. I don't sit there and study out the scripture on messages. I don't come up with a topic and think about what we're going to teach you on. Here's how these messages come about, just for you to know and for everyone online to know, is that I wake up in the morning about an hour and a half before the time of the message, and I pray, God, what do you want me to teach today? And then I say, show me the scriptures, and boom, he tells me the scriptures, I write them on the paper, the paper has no text other than the scriptures, and then we read the scriptures, and let the Bible do the talk. That's very important, because a lot of people will, you know, prepare for hours and days for a message. And they got these jokes in it, they got stories and funnies and all this stuff, and they get prepared. They have three scriptures, and then they talk for three hours with no, no biblical content. But in our messages, in our Bible study, in our um, ministry, we actually let the Bible do the talking. And we just read it and then understand what the Bible says. Right. So that's very important to, to understand what we do. So we go through a lot of scripture. Today it's Matthew 17 we're going to start. And we're going to start in verse 20. Matthew 17, starting in verse 20, it says. I need it bigger. You need it bigger? Oh, okay. Let me Much make the screen over. Yeah, there you go. Hey, I need it bigger too, so I understand. Is that big enough? Uh, yeah. Okay, there you go. There you go. So there you go. That's better. Matthew 17, starting in verse 20, it says. He replied, because you have little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So that's very important for us to understand is that we've done many studies on faith and how we need to live by faith. And the Bible says the righteous will live by faith, not by sight. And here Jesus says, truly, truly I tell you, because he says it sometimes one way, he'll say, I tell you the truth. And then sometimes he says, you know, I tell you, um, truly I tell you. So those mean the same thing. So here it says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, and the mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds in the world, mm -hmm. one of the smallest seeds, but it grows into this awesome plant, right. okay, that gives, of course, mustard. Um, I think a mustard seed gives mustard, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know what it is. No. I don't know how you make mustard. <laughs> I don't know why I just threw that in. That's my opinion. <laughs> I'm assuming I, I, it does because it's I called a mustard so. seed. But anyway, <laughs> that was funny. But anyway, it says nothing will be impossible for you. And that's the thing that we got to realize is that if the Bible says nothing will be impossible for you, then we have to believe that nothing will be impossible for you. And if you really think about what we've done in these last hundred years of, in society versus the last 6,000 years in society, it's been unbelievable. We can now pick up a phone today, talk to someone on the other side of the planet in a matter of seconds with no wires or nothing. How's that possible? 
is because someone dreamed about it, they thought about it, and it appeared because God made it happen. Now, he made it happen for our good, for us to be able to communicate, because there's no way for everybody in the world to be able to hear the message of God if the Internet hadn't come. And he said he's not coming until the last days, and everyone will see it. Every eye will see. Well, how is every eye going to see if there's no Internet or ways to be able to see that information? It talks about every ear will hear different things in Scripture. How would that happen without Internet if, if these aren't the last days? These are the last days. And you can see it easily in scripture. We've done many scriptures on that. But the big thing that we have to see is that the Bible says, and Jesus says, that if you have faith, just a little faith, that nothing will be impossible for you. And that's a truth that we have to accept. But I want to ask you, if you really think about it, what, what mountains are you trying to move right now? I know for me, you know, I had a goal for this ministry. And the goal was, and I set this goal a few weeks ago, and I said, God, I want this ministry to grow to 500 people online, online and here locally to start watching it. I started teaching that message. And surely enough, immediately after I taught that message, we got challenged big time. Three or four people in the ministry started getting all this false doctrine sent to them, and then they started seeing it, and, and they were young baby disciples. And so a couple of them got you know swayed away, and, and then we had to pull them back and swayed away, and it's Really interesting how Satan just went after us because we teach the truth. And as soon as we had a mission to grow, what did he do? Came after us. And that's what he does. And I'm sure that it may have happened individually in your life too. And I don't know all the circumstances, but I know for me, he has come after me. And I'll tell you how he comes after me. Because we did a study the other day that Satan um, tempts you based on what's common to man. And that's 1 Corinthians 10. 10. What's common to you is how he tempts you. He doesn't tempt you on things that's not common to you. That doesn't make sense. He finds out what your little weaknesses are, and then he tempts you based on those little weaknesses. And that's what he does to me. And my weaknesses, um, confusion, confusion of mind. So literally speaking, I'll get a business opportunity thrown at me. I'll get an idea thrown at me. And it just takes me off track. And me and Jamie had to create a plan, a focus, to stay focused. And focus, the definition of focus is follow one course, until successful follow one course until successful and so i had to learn and i have to practice focus because satan will throw something in and then get me off track get me off track give me a different direction and then the next thing you know i'm doing nothing i'm ineffective and unproductive like the bible says and that's his way of getting me because he knows not breaking my faith he knows that he knows i'm a priest this message he knows you couldn't put a gun to my head and make me miss the sabbath day or any of his holy day he knows that so because of that, so he just says, okay, let me get some of these dominions and little mind demons, and let's get on Stephen so he can be unfocused, so he can't motivate this group to go brighter 500 people. <laughs> That's what he does. And it works. He, he, I think, and I told Jamie, I said, Jamie, I need you to pray over my office, because I think I got a couple of demons hiding in there somewhere that gets me unfocused and messes up my desk and gets me off track and throws up another website. Just, oh, it, it's unbelievable how that happens consistently. So today, they're gone this weekend. I said, me and Maddox, we're going to have some fun, and I'm going to reorganize an office. I'm cutting out all the fat. I'm getting it all out because i got to stay focused on the mission. You know, because Satan knows how to deceive you. So that's the mountains that I'm moving. But what you want to look at in this message is what mountains are you trying to move that Satan's trying to get you off track? You know, what is that mountain? You need to really think about it. What are you trying to do for the Lord? that Satan's trying to throw you off, and how does he throw you off? Because you got to know how he throws you off. Because if you're not aware of the deception he uses on you, then you'll consistently be deceived. That's very important to realize. If you don't know how he deceives you, then you're going to consistently be deceived. Let's look at this. Let's look at um, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. 11. 2 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 14. It says, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. That's a very interesting scripture, isn't it? He masquerades as an angel of light. Now, there was a few days ago, there was a day that that people were celebrating all around the world. It was on October 31st, and people call that day Halloween. It's a, it's a satanic 
day. If you do the history of it, it's a satanic day. And people were walking around in all these different costumes masquerading as something else, right? And they were pretending to be something else. Now, they may have been a receptionist at a business, but they put on an a outfit to be a witch. Let's just use that as an example. So they were become, trying to act like they're someone else. And that's what, you know, people do. And they thought it was a fun day, but actually it's a satanic day completely against God. There's no God in Halloween by any stretch of the imagination. It's a satanic day. Why people that call themselves believers honor it, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. But that's because they don't realize how bad that is from God's perspective. Right. But, but if you look at what this says, it says Satan does the same thing. He puts on a costume also. Mm -hmm. You know what his costume is? An angel of light. Mm -hmm. It looks good. It sounds good. They may, and, and you know what it sounds like? It, it may sound like people that are godly may sound like this, that may teach the word. You know, there might be people teaching the word because it says it's the angel of light. And then, and that's very important to understand is that if it's an angel, not that might, you're not even going to recognize that it's bad. You're not going to recognize it. You're not going to see it. It's going to be, because it's called deception. See, deception means it has to look real. It has to look true. That's why people buy these very expensive costumes. They paint themselves um, to look like somebody else so they can deceive the masses. I saw this video the other day. It was really cool. I showed you, Maddox. It was, it was about basketball. Um, this, this guy's right on the court playing basketball, and this old guy comes walking over, he comes stumbling up, and he walks over, he sits down, and he's one of the guy's uncles, and he's like, would you want to play uncle? And this guy's like 70-something years old, full gray hair and the whole shot. So he goes, he goes, yeah, I'll come out. So I'll play with you. So he's playing with the basketball and air ball and missing the balls and stuff, right? So then they, you know, pick teams, and everybody's laughing at the old guy because he, you know, can't play. So then all of a sudden, next thing you know, the old guy started getting the rhythm, started loosening it up a little bit, and he started making jump shots and, and you know, moving around and putting it through his legs. And I mean, he was handling these young guys. And I'm talking about doing backspin, dunking backwards. I mean, this seven-year-old guy is just, just handling all of them, just dealing with them. But what they did was it was funny because they re reviewed the tape and they re rewinded it back four hours earlier, and he was in a makeup shop and he was a professional basketball player. And they put a costume on him and they had makeup and, made him, made and they him made him look him. like an old guy. Yeah. So because they made him look like an old guy, they thought he was old because he really looked old. It was a really good costume. He masqueraded as an old fellow that couldn't play basketball. And he dealt with those guys and they never knew it until the video came out. So that's called deception. You see, what if he would have put a wager on it or a bet? And he, he would have won that bet. <laughs> he would have won some money that night. But the question is, how many times does Satan deceive you in your life? How many times does Satan masquerade in your life thinking that something's good or something's right or it's, or it's a godly and, and, and he's teaching you the message that you, you believe is true? And it sounds good because they use the scripture. And you know one thing about Satan? He's, he's great at it because he uses scripture to deceive you. How did he deceive Jesus when he was on the mountain? He used scripture. And what did, Satan, what did Jesus have to do? Combat it with scripture. So to be able to combat Satan with scripture, you need to know the scripture. That's right. Because if you don't know the Bible, he will get you because he knows the Bible better than you do. Yeah, he does. And Satan <laughs> masquerades as an angel of light. Notice he doesn't say he masquerades as a devil. <laughs> he doesn't say that, does he? He doesn't, he doesn't come in with horns. That'd be too obvious. You can't deceive somebody. If Satan walked in with a horn and a tail and flying through walls and fire behind him, he wouldn't deceive anybody. Everybody stay away from him. Nobody masquerades as your minister. He masquerades as quote unquote disciples of Jesus that believe in Jesus. He masquerades as uh, popes and people that call themselves spiritual yeah. men and women, as angels of light. And that's very important for us to rec recognize is that that's what Satan does. But let's, let's read the whole thing now. Let's, let's read all of it because it's very important to understand how this comes about so you can see what it looks like in scripture. This is, like I said, 1 Corinthians, we're in 11, we're gonna start in verse one now. It says, I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you one husband to Christ that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that 
just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preach, or if you receive a different spirit than the spirit you receive, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Wow. And that was back then when the gospel was just being preached. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, do you think it's gotten more deceptive or less? Yeah. Far more. That's why there's 490,000 denominations in the country, not in the world, that's, that's in the country. Over 400,000 different denominations of Christianity. But that's, that's the in the world, in the world, in, in the United States, is over four hundred thousand, over four hundred thousand denominations. Guess how many denominations are in the Bible? Yeah. None. Yeah. <laughs> There's no denominations in the Bible. <laughs> They're called disciples. They read the Bible and they obey it. Right. There's, there's no such thing as a denomination. There's no name of a church in the Bible. None. Jesus is the head, the apostles, and they read the Bible and they obey it. There's no name of a church. Our ministry is called Save Our Truth. We're not right. a church. They call themselves the way. The, it's, it's the disciples are the body. You're baptized into the body. Right. So the body can be different places all over the world. There's no building called a church in the Bible. That's man-made. There's no building. There's not a single building in the Bible that's called a church. The church are people. You're baptized into the body. Yeah. So if I go out in the middle of the wilderness and we're not baptized, well, he's now part of the body. He doesn't have to come to my congregation to be part of the body. No, there's no such thing in scripture. That's man-made. And that's why there's 430,000, over 4,000 different denominations, because everyone wants their way to do it. But there's only one way to do it, so read the Bible and obey. There's only one way to Anybody. honor God. There's only one. See, but this is what it says. But look at what it says here in scripture. Verse 3. It says, but I'm afraid that as just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere devotion to Christ. So it's, he's going to affect the mind. It's the thinking. Notice that? He said your mind. It doesn't say your heart, because your heart comes later. It says the mind will be led away. Okay, but look what it says how. For if someone comes to you and preaches another Jesus. So now he's telling you how you're going to be deceived. Is someone, a person, is going to preach to you another Jesus. Well, well what, how, do you, how do you do that? How, how do you preach another Jesus? I'll tell you how. You take the scriptures and then you put your own opinion and beliefs behind it. That's how you preach another Jesus. So I'll give you, give you a couple of real life examples today. Um, Jesus said, repent and be baptized, or Jesus taught in scripture, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, so you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's for you, your children, all who are far off, for all who are Lord God are called. That's Acts 2, 36 through 41. That's what he says, right? That's what Jesus says in the scriptures. Well, what does man say today? Just say, say the sinner's prayer, and you get your sins forgiven. See, that's called preaching, Jesus in, uh, preaching in Jesus' name, but leading them astray. That's what that's called. Or, you know, thing, saying things like, if you just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're saved. Or you're saved by faith alone. Now, there's no scripture in the Bible of that. So they took words like faith that are biblical scriptures, and then they deceived the masses. And that's ministers that are doing that. It's not Buddhists that's doing it. If you notice, they're preaching another Jesus. They're not preaching another faith like Catholic or, or they're not preaching, well, Catholic actually would, but they're not preaching things like um, a Muslim or, you know, they're not preaching Muhammad that's going to deceive the masses, that's going to deceive us. It says they're going to be preaching another Jesus. So that's who the Bible tells us to look out for, are people who are preaching a different Jesus. That's what's in this Bible. That's very important to understand. So if someone's being taught a teaching that's not in the Bible, that's who he's telling you to watch out for. And that's who you can be deceived by. Very important to get it. So let's keep going, though. Verse 7, it says, if you preach another Jesus, other than the Jesus we preach, or if you receive a different spirit than the spirit you receive, which means there must be a different spirit out in the world. Well, when do you receive the Holy Spirit? 
And baptism. Maddox knows that, 10 years old. So we know we receive the Holy Spirit at baptism. So if someone tells you that you receive the Holy Spirit at a prayer, but they can't show you the Bible study on it, then guess what they're teaching you? Another spirit. Because you might receive a spirit at a prayer, but it ain't going to be the spirit of Jesus at that prayer. <laughs> you understand? Because you get that at baptism. Based on the scriptures, read Acts 2, 36 and 40. So you receive the spirit of God there. You receive some other spirit by doing other things. Very important to get this. These are these basic foundations. But look what it says. If you receive another gospel from the one you received in the Bible, right? If you receive another gospel. So what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of the kingdom of heaven. So I'll give you an example. You see, let me show you what another gospel would look like now. The Bible teaches that, and, and we'll, we've gone through many scriptures on this, but the Bible teaches that the gospel is the good news of the kingdom of heaven. Where is the kingdom of heaven right now? In heaven. That's where the kingdom of God is. It's in heaven. I was told that the kingdom of God is on earth, that you are born, you go to the kingdom of God. That doesn't make sense because the Bible says no flesh and blood can enter the kingdom of God. You have to be changed at the truth of an eye, the last trumpet, to, be, to go to the kingdom of God. Jesus. That's right. No sin is allowed in the kingdom of God, so it can't be here on earth. You understand? That's exactly right. So it's very important. That's a different gospel. So you got to see there's, there's messages of the kingdom of God that are deceptive teachings out there. So this is the thing we got to realize is that it's ministers and people that are preaching God's word are the ones that are deceiving the believers, the ones that want to obey God. It's not people that are not teaching God's word. It's people that are, and that's who he's telling us to watch out for. But let's keep reading, though. Let's keep reading down a little further and see what it says. We're going to start down in there, verse 12 now. I need it a little bit bigger. I can't see it. Can't see it? No. Yeah, yeah but if it's too big, then I can't get it on the screen. So uh, let's just, we're going to have to, you're going to have to. That's better. Um, read it in your Bible. That's what you should be doing. So let's go down to verse 12, because I can't, this computer is a little different. It's a new computer. So let's go with um, verse 12. It says, and I will keep on doing what I'm doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. Mm -hmm. So what it says about these people now. Again, it's talking about these people. So look at what it says. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. Wow. There are people right now today, 2,000 years after Jesus, that call themselves apostles. Just go online. There's people that call themselves apostles. Mm -hmm. But how can you possibly be an apostle? Because the, an apostle is a person who walked with Jesus. That's the definition of an apostle. You can't be an apostle unless you walk with Jesus. Unless somebody is 2,000 years old, they haven't walked with Jesus. So they can't be called an apostle. That's why the Bible calls them false apostles. Very important to understand this. So if you see somebody online preaching in Jesus' name, calling themselves an apostle, that's impossible. So that means they're a false apostle. <laughs> it's easy to see. See, when you understand deception, the truth becomes easy to see. It's just when you're in the deception, the truth is very difficult to see. Let's look at another thing it says here. It says deceitful workers. So he didn't just stop with false apostles. Now he's talking about deceitful workers. That would be anyone else, including me. I'm going to put myself right in there because I'm a deceitful. I, I could be considered a deceitful worker if I'm teaching something that's not in Scripture. I could be considered. So I got to throw me in the mix too. That's why it's very important to be careful if you're going to decide to teach that you're teaching the Word of God because you'll be considered a deceitful worker. And it's easy to see deceitful workers because this is how it looks on, online because I do a lot of ministry on Facebook. And one of the things I'll see is um, I'll put up a scripture of the Bible, and people will give their opinion about what that scripture says. Now, they won't throw any collaborating scripture to back up their opinion. They throw out their beliefs, right? And this is a very important to understand when you're studying scripture, is that the word belief means opinion unless you can back it up with scripture. You see, if I say my, I believe something, I can wholeheartedly believe it. But if I can't show a scripture to back it up, then it's just my opinion. And everyone can have their own opinion. There's nothing wrong with having your opinion. Just don't make it to appear like it's fact. It's true. You understand? Mm -hmm. So what I do is I show what the Bible says. 
and let the Bible do the talking. Like right now, I'm just talking. So I'm throwing out what I'm saying about it. But the word belief, it means opinion. All you got to do is just look it up and tell you what it means. That's not my opinion. This is a fact. The word belief means opinion. And then she can back it up with fact. And right now, when we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about biblical fact. Okay, so let's keep going, though. It says, deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ. So again, these deceitful workers masquerade, they put on a costume to look like disciples of Jesus. That's what they look like. So they're not looking unspiritual. They're not out there sinning like crazy. They may be in churches. They may be on the pulpit teaching the word. They may be leading the songs. They may be doing all types of things. The Bible says those are the people we need to be careful. Or leading the country. Leading the country mm -hmm. or any of those types of things. They can be leading in many different ways. But see, even people that are leading in high positions in the world, they're not really preaching the word. So that's not who he's talking about. He's talking about people that are preaching the word. <laughs> Very important to understand this. He's talking about people that call themselves Christian or call themselves disciple. Those are the ones to watch out for. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible says. Because those are deceitful workers. And look what it says now. Verse 14, and no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light also. It's not surprising then than if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. So these people that call themselves disciples, call themselves Christians, but don't teach what the Bible says, do three scriptures, a funny joke, a couple personal stories and a, and a personal testimony, and then they don't teach anything about some of the truths in the Bible, the Bible calls them servants of Satan. That's what the Bible says. Because they're not teaching the truth of the scripture. So that's who he tells us to watch out for. And look what it says at the end there. It says their end will be what their actions deserve. If I may share something that what you're preaching, Stephen. Can you talk a little louder so they can hear you? Yeah, and what you're preaching, uh, on First John uh, chapter 4, verses 20 and 21st, mm -hmm. the Lord warned, warned us about that. Oh, no doubt about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he yeah. warns us many, many times, yeah. and he warned us right here. Yeah. See, and this is the cool part about it. He goes through many different warnings, but in this one right here, he just warned us of who exactly to look out for. That's exactly That's, right. So, so good. They, they have always existed. Yeah, but they're here even more prevalent now in the last days. Far more prevalent. That's why there's 400,000 400, different denominations. Because there should not be any. There should be one. Read the Bible and obey it. Real simple. And that's what we teach. So let's keep going. Um, so one of the things that we've got to become different. We must become different. Let's look at Matthew 18. We want to not look like the people that are teaching deception. We want to look at like people that are teaching the truth. So Matthew 18, starting in verse 1, it says, At that time, disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. He said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes this lowly position, like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So that's one of the things we've got to do. We've got to become like a little child. Now, what are some qualities of children? Give me some qualities that you would think that children have right now. Matt, if you're a child, so what, what, are, what are some qualities? They are humble. That's one I can tell you right now. They're humble. They're, they're, they're humble to the... Word of God. When they, they lack hear. haughtiness. They lack haughtiness. Yeah, well, some of them. They're, 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 <laughs> they, we they're, can work. They need to work on that too sometimes. They're, they're, they walk with pure hearts. Yeah, they walk with pure hearts. Yeah. In other words, they have faith. Yeah. They have faith, big time faith, right? Mm -hmm. They they trust. They trust. They trust their parents. They trust. I mean, my kids can go to sleep on a car and wake up in another city, and they just travel. Okay, where well, we go now? <laughs> they just go. In other words, they let go and let God. They let go and let their parents just take control. And we need to do the same thing with God. We need to let go. Because the Bible says, 
that we need to become like these children or we'll never enter the kingdom of God. We've got to be humble to God's teaching. That's one thing I love about my kids is when we teach them things, um, like the Sabbath day, we teach them about the commandments and things like that. Yet they don't fight. They don't say, oh, no, that Sabbath day. What are you talking? We used to worship on Sunday. But the Bible says we need to worship on the seventh day. They don't fight it. Guess what they do? They say, okay, I see it in Scripture. Amen. And I love how they come back and confess. Say, man, I'm sorry I was wrong. When they are wrong or when they do something wrong, they confess. They get open with their life. And it's very important that the Bible says unless we change and become like these little children, we'll never enter the kingdom of God. That's scary if you really think about it, yeah. because he doesn't give any specifics. <laughs> he understand? Mm -hmm. So if we have that heart to, to think we know everything and we think we got it all together, we think we're going in the right direction. If we think you cannot fall, the Bible says be careful. You gotta be careful because if you don't think you can be deceived, you're already deceived. Yeah. So you listen to this message. If you think you can't be deceived, you're already deceived. I know for a fact Satan can deceive me because he's consistently trying different ways to get me off track. Consistently. Sometimes they work and I have to get back on track. Sometimes I have to get open and you hear me every week. I get open about something, good or bad. I'm letting you know what's going on right here on camera for everyone to know. I'm just like you. We're all together. He's like a roaring lion. He's like a roaring lion, just like it says in Scripture. Yeah, see, see, one of the things that um, the deception, he wants us to just kind of relax, lay back. We got it made. So let's look what he says here. Luke 12. Luke. Yeah, Luke 12. Starting in verse 13. Yeah, it says, some in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? Look how Jesus talked. Man, get out of here. What's the matter with you? Because of the way he said it. Man, who appointed me judge or arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard of all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. That's another big thing we got to watch out for, mm -hmm. is the deceitfulness of wealth. That's another word we got called, the deceitfulness of wealth. It says, watch out, because of all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of all this. So our, is, that one of, is that our heart that's wanting more and more and more stuff? Wanting to build bigger barns? Let's keep reading. And he told them this parable. And remember, who are parables taught to? Who are parables taught for? They're taught for, for the unbelievers. The unbelievers, that's right. They're taught for the people that are deceived. Because then they won't hear. Every hearing, but not hearing. They're not receiving. So oh, that must parables, be He's green. <laughs> parables are taught for the people that are deceived. Let me see. He's looked That are honoring the truth and are honoring the scriptures. The, the talk for the people that are not honoring yeah, the scripture. The mistress of the gospel was uh, revealed to those who believed in Jesus. That's right. That's right. So the reason he we taught the parable. The re that's exactly right. The reason he taught in parable is so that people won't understand. So look at what he says in this parable, verse 16. And he taught them. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant crop, a harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll, I'll store my surplus. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life may be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Wow. That's a mindset that we have to understand. Is that if you notice what it doesn't say. So this is where people get deception. Well, you, you need to be poor because it says if you store up stuff for yourself. No, that's not what the Bible says. What it says is whoever stores up for themselves, but is not rich towards God. In other words, you can have both. There's nothing wrong with having things. God provides. He blesses us while we're on earth to what we can handle. Years ago, I prayed a prayer, and God has been upholding that prayer for a long time, and that is, 
to not give me any more money than I can responsibly handle. And God has upheld that <laughs> message, that prayer. I'm kind of trying to change the prayer now because I want to do more for the kingdom of God and for, for the body of Christ. I'm trying to say, God, can you recant that a little bit and give me a little bit more blessing so I can do more for you? Uh, yeah, I, I take that back a little bit. Not because of, not because I can't responsibly handle it. No, I do want to make sure that I still can responsibly handle it. And maybe the reason why God's blessing me in the level that he is only because I maybe can't responsibly handle this better. I need to still repent more. I need to become different. And that's one of the things this week I had to make a decision is I was out at the gym last week and I made a decision I need to become different. And you need to become different. And, and, I, and I sat there and I wrote out this thing and I just bought the domain last night that um, it's called Re, Redesign Yourself. And I'm redesigning myself now because I've been a sales trainer. I've been doing what I'm doing, but I need to become different. And I'm redesigning myself. I'm actually working on a book and all kinds of different things, not because I'm trying to redesign myself to do more, to make more money and to do things for me, but to do things more for God. I have to realign my life. Like I told you, we had to put our life, Jesus in the center and everything else around. As soon as I started preaching that, man, Satan came from every direction at me, every direction. But that's okay. I'm still fighting him off a little bit, you know, throwing my lefts and rights and hooks and trying to get him out of here and his demons. But the bottom line is that's what he does. He goes after us. But the Bible says we need to store up and be rich towards God. And I can look back in my life 10 years ago when I turned 40, my wife gave me this gigantic party. It was like 100 people at this party. It was awesome. It was a surprise party. I knew nothing about it. I had a big office. We had 10,000 square feet of office space, hundreds of people around me, all this stuff, making great money and everything. And that was 10 years ago to yesterday. 10 years ago when we threw that party. And you know what? 10 years later, I'm not in the same financial spot. I don't have people all around me like that, but you know what? I am filthy rich towards God. I am the wealthiest guy on the planet towards God. As a matter of fact, here's why I believe that. This is my opinion, of course. The reason I believe that, we had one of the wealthiest family members in our house, one of the Rockefellers. As it was Rockefeller, Rothschilds, one of the Rothschilds. One of the Rothschilds. They own over 500 billion, I'm sorry, that's not true. $500 trillion in assets, that family. And one of the grandkids was in my house studying the Bible with me the other day. It was interesting because he couldn't touch me about anything. It didn't matter what his family had because he's not rich towards God and neither is his family. He knows it. He knows who his family is and what they're doing to the world. And so, so it's very important to understand that you need to be rich towards the Lord. Yeah. That is the most important thing. And the way you get rich toward the Lord is by listening to the scriptures and being obedient to the scriptures. Did you want to share something? And actually, the first uh, uh, commandment is, is very clear. When it, the Lord says, seek the kingdom of God first and love him above all things. Yeah, actually. Above right. all things That's right. on earth. Right. That's right. Love him and above all things. Is, it's not the problem. Um, people true. want to hold on to the money. And that's, I guess, it's okay. We're not going to prejudge or judge. However, the problem is when people, they allow money to owe them. That's when that's well, it's the love that's of right. money. That's right. That's right. It's the love of money. And, it's, love of money. and the whole point is they store it for themselves everything else other than God. But this is Satan's deception. So we just got to make sure that we consistently are working on becoming different, like the Bible says. Let's look at the third truth that we need to focus on, that we need to work on. So we need to work on ourselves of making sure we are filthy rich towards God. And you got to ask yourself right now, are you filthy rich towards God? Are you loaded from God's perspective? Or are you, you know, running on empty spiritually? Because if you're running on empty spiritually, Satan's coming after you. I feel He's that coming I after am, you. I feel that I am a very very wealthy in, in God's uh, in God's truth and wisdom. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Let's, let's keep going through this one. Look what it says here. It says, verse 18. This is Matthew 18. Starting in verse 18. It says, <laughs> Truly I tell you, 
Who, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So I'm going to stop right there. So it says whatever you bind on earth, you'll be bound in heaven. Now, we can go out and amass all this stuff. We can get cars and houses and clothes and all these different things. We can amass all this stuff. But what it says here is that whatever you buy on earth will be bound in heaven. In other words, whatever you gather on earth will gather in heaven. But here's the question. How many cars can we take to heaven? How much clothes can we take to heaven? Retirement plans can we take to heaven? Money can we take to heaven? Businesses can we take to heaven? No, the only thing we can take to heaven are souls, are other people. And that's the only thing. And the Bible and God wants us to gather souls to take them to heaven when he comes on the Feast of Trumpets. Most people don't even know when that is. Most people have no clue what the Feast of Trumpets means. Don't even understand that feast day. Don't understand any of the feast days because we're told they're Jewish feasts. They have nothing to do with Jews. They have to do with the Israelites. They're the Lord's feast. But no one knows what the Feast of Trumpets is. And if you don't know what the Feast of Trumpets is, you need to go watch one of our videos on YouTube called The Hidden Feast. Because it's very easy to understand the feast days and you understand Jesus. If you know Jesus, you'll know his feast days. The Bible says if you don't know him, you won't know his days. You won't know his ways. You won't know his teachings. And so you got to ask yourself, do you even know that day he's coming? Because it's very important. Because it says whatever the day he's coming, whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. We want to be ready, right? Well, what does ready mean? Just ready? No, ready means ready on the day he's coming. And you'll see that here in a second. But the big thing you got to see here, it says that whatever you bind. So we have to be binding things on earth. And that means we need to be binding the soul. That's why I'm so proud of my mom inviting a guest over, inviting a friend, our friend over, because it's so important that we do that. We share this message, this truth for everyone. Disciples, non-disciples, because we all have been deceived at some level. That's right. We all have been deceived. So it's very important to understand that. And then let's keep going, though. Let's read a little further, a little further um, up a little bit. So we're going to read now verse 15 through 18. Let's read a little further up so we can see how it's in context. Look what it says to you. It says, verse 15, if a brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. That's one of the ways you want to handle when brother or sister sins. Not necessarily sins against you, but is in sin. And this is very important. When someone's in sin, you want to be able to go point out their sin. Guess what is considered sin? What is the definition of sin in the Bible? Does anyone know? The definition of sin is anything that it is offensive and that it's not in in. In, in alignment with the Lord. Yeah, uh, yeah, that is true. It's definitely not in alignment with the Lord, but specifically what the Bible says is sin, and you can read this for yourself, you can look it up. I'm not going to go to it today, but we've studied it many times. But what the definition of sin is in the Bible is lawlessness, That's true. is disobedience to the law. Yeah, but I thought the law was nailed to a cross. I thought the law was done away with when Jesus died. Well, then if that's the definition of sin, then that means there's no more sin. That doesn't make any sense. See, that's called, again, deception. See, the Bible says disobedience to the law is sin. But I thought the sin was nailed to a cross. How is that nailed to a cross then? How do we not have to obey the law? Don't, how do we have to obey the law? And, and, but, but the law is sin, and, and, but it's gone away. It doesn't make sense. See, this is what it is. It's just called a misunderstanding. The commandments, the Ten Commandments, haven't been gone, done away with at all. They're all still there. They're all from the beginning of the Bible to the end. So it says it's very important to understand this. Look what it says, the brothers in sin. So that's why we have to share this message of what sin is. Sin is disobedience to the commandments. Disobedience to the commandments. And guess what the fourth commandment is in the scriptures of the 10? Matthew, what's the fourth commandment of the 10? What's the fourth commandment? What's today? Oh, honor your Sabbath. <laughs> That's right. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So if you're not honoring the Sabbath day, then guess what? You're in disobedience to the sin, to the commandment. No difference than if you're murdering. It's in the same Ten Commandments. Yeah. If you murder or if you commit adultery, that's still sin. The fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Yeah, the Lord talks about it all. He, of course he does. He talks about it all throughout the Bible from you beginning see, to end. You look a woman. Yeah, that's part of the thing. That's right. So you've already committed adultery. That's right. So let's keep going then. Let's now look a little further. 
Look what it says. It says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two <coughs> others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If still they do not listen, tell it to the church. If they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Mm -hmm. For truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be losed in heaven. This is very important. So that's why it's so important to go share this message with believers. It's not with non, just non-believers. Yeah, we need to share with non-believers too, the ones that are open. But we need to be sharing this message with the disciples, the ones that are disobedient to God's commandments, the ones that are not obeying his Sabbath days, the ones that are not obeying his holy days and don't even know what the holy days are. We need to be sharing this because they don't even realize they're in sin. Do you know you can be in sin and not know it? Yeah. That's called deception. <laughs> of course. <laughs> if you don't, okay, think about this. Give an example. Jesus says in the Ten Commandments, he says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you should work, but on the seventh day of the Sabbath to the Lord. On it, do no work, neither you, your manservant, your maid servant, right? You should not work on the Sabbath day. But let's say you don't know what the Sabbath day because nobody teaches it at your congregation. Let's say you are listening online. None of your ministers tell you what the Sabbath day is. They don't teach it because they say it's nailed to a cross. You don't need to obey it anymore. That's what was told to me when I used to go to church. They told me. I gave them 190 scriptures of all the scriptures from beginning to end saying that we do need to honor the Sabbath day. But they couldn't give me a single one saying we don't. But they said it's nailed to a cross. We don't need to obey it anymore because we worship on a different day. At that time, it was Sunday. Then I went to another Christian church, and they said it was on Saturday. But there is no Saturday or Sunday in the Bible, so that didn't make sense. So I looked it up, and it said the seventh day, 14, 21st, 28. Today is the 21st day of God's month, based on his new moon calendar. And so when we learned this, I was like, wow, it's right there in Scripture. It's easy to see. How come they're not teaching this to me at church? How come they don't tell me that? Because what I learned is that because they didn't tell me that and they told me that the day I need to worship was on Sunday, but then that means I was breaking the Sabbath day every week because I was working on the seventh day. I was working on the 14th day. I was working on the 21st and 20th day when God told me not to. So who did I need to listen to, man or the Bible? We listen to the Bible, and we decided to come honor God on the seventh day, and God's been blessing it ever since. See, you can be deceived even though you don't know the deception, and guess what? The consequence will still be the same. See, if you're speeding on the freeway going 90 miles an hour, but you don't live here, and you live in England where there's an autobahn, you can go as fast as you want, but you come over here onto the 405 freeway, and you're doing 120 because you think, hey, all these freeways, you get to speed, right? No, and a police officer pulls you over and you say, hey, I just got off the plane. I just came from the airport and I was driving just going to my appointment. Yeah, but you were doing like 120, buddy. You can't go 120. What do you mean? I, I live in English. We go 180 if we want to. We got really fast cars over there. Yeah, but we're in the United States. And in California, the law is you got to go 65 miles an hour. Yeah, but I didn't know the law. What do you think is going to happen to the guy? He's, get He's still going to get the ticket. <laughs> right? Just because... It, just because he didn't know the law doesn't mean he's not going to suffer the consequences. So here it is. Ignorance of the law is of no excuse. Because it's in the rule book when you came to California and decided to drive the car, you still needed to obey the law. And in the same way, spiritually speaking, you got a Bible? The Bible tells you not to, to, to disobey the Sabbath day. Just read it. Just read your own Bible. It's in there. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It's not, like, it's not even hidden. It's all throughout the scripture from beginning to end. But here's the question. How many of your ministers are teaching you about the commandments? How many of your ministers teach you about the Ten Commandments? When's the last time you had a message about honoring the Ten Commandments? Name one time. Because the Bible says in Deuteronomy, it says, impress it on your children, on their foreheads, on their hands. Talk about it when they wake up, when they go to sleep. All day long, they tell you to talk about the commandments all day long. But when's the last time you got a message on it? Don't get no message on that. Well, well, why not? If the Bible tells us to, to talk about it all the time, but the ministers at your church tell you and never talk about it, and they tell you you don't have to obey the fourth commandment. So now, who's those people that are masquerading teaching those false doctrines? You gotta look at that. You gotta ask yourself a question because it's very important. If you don't know that answer, you know that, that, that's a, also very clear. What also where he says that 
to whom much given, much is required. That's exactly right. So it's very important that we understand so that we need to obey what the Bible says. Yes. And it says if somebody's in that type of fault and they're deceived, it's our job to go and share it with them. Mm -hmm. It's our job to teach the truth. That's what I teach mostly to churches. I teach to ministers. I try to teach to disciples. I teach to Christians. Yeah, I teach to the lost too. But God's called me to teach the truth to the people that want to love him and want to follow him. Because those are the ones who are deceived the most because they think they got it all together. That's the challenge. If you think you got it all together and you know you're going the right direction, you're probably more deceived than someone who's lost who knows they're deceived and knows they're a mess. That's Satan's whole goal is to get you to believe you're right with God. You're, you got it all together. You're, you're going in the right direction. He did it to me and he does it to all of us. So it's very important that we understand this. And so let's go to a couple of last scriptures here. So we got to understand Satan's deception. One of them is to hold bitterness in our heart and do not forgive when someone does you wrong. That's another way he gets us to be deceived. He gets us to do that. And here's how we handle this type of situation. Because that's another big thing that happens is when we start to try to share this message, some people may not like it. I've had people get mad at me when I shared this message with them. They won't talk to me no more. They're brothers, people that are disciples, people that I know for a fact were baptized for the forgiveness of sin, yeah. and they won't even talk to me anymore because I'm sharing with them. The Bible says we need to honor the commandments. Oh, yeah, bro, we don't have to do that anymore. Well, can you show me a scripture on that? Well, because I, I got 190 of them that says I do. Can you show me one that tells me I don't need to obey Jesus' commandments? It's, it's crazy. And then they get mad at me, but the Bible tells me how I need to handle it. So let's look at what the Bible says about that. Matthew 18. Yeah, Matthew 18. Look what it says. Starting in verse 21 now. <clears throat> verse 21, it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother and sister when they sin against me? That's the question. Because, you know, when I, when I share the truth with a brother or sister, and then they get mad at me for sharing the truth, then they just sinned against me. Now they're sinning against me. That's what the Bible says. So he says, well, how many times shall I forgive them? And the Bible says up to seven times. And Jesus answers, I tell you, not seven, but se not seven times, but 77 times. So they were trying to say, do I have to forgive them at least seven times? Nope, you got to forgive them 77 times. In other words, a limited amount of times. Right. And look what it says, verse 23. For, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. He began the settlement, a man who owed them 10 thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, all that he had, be sold to repay the debt. <clears throat> then his servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison and he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled the debt for your, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jail to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's, that's it's hard interesting. Sometimes. It is hard. It but, all depends the, 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 the magnitude of the offense. No, no doubt about it, it's hard. Committed against us. However, in my personal opinion, I view unforgiveness as some type of cancer that just eats you inside. No out. doubt about it, that, that's so exactly you right. You have to free yourself from that because, after all, you, you, you become a better person by just letting it go 
and, and forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. That's right. That's right. And we have to forgive. But here's the thing about the forgiveness. And God, please help me. Here's the thing about the forgiveness. The forgiveness has nothing to do with the other person. That's right. The forgiveness has to do with you. But here's the big thing that you got to see is that if you don't forgive your brother and sister when they sin against you or when a person sins against you, your heavenly father won't forgive you. So it's so important that we do it no matter how big the magnitude of the forgiveness is or the sin is against you. That is so important of how we need to handle people and handle situations in life. Right. May I say something which is very important for me when we talk about this subject? It's a lot of people have a misconception to think that when you forgive, that means you have to, uh, you know, be in, 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 you know, with those people in communication. No, not really. Uh, the Lord talks that we should never go back to the moment. We could forgive. But that doesn't mean that unless those people remain the way they are, because as 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 we think, so we are, and as we continue to think, we so we remain. Mm -hmm. So if those people remain with those kind of ungodly actions and deeds, definitely you don't want them in your life. I personally do not. But that doesn't mean that I have to go back to the moment and hang around with them and be with them. No. I just refuse to do that. That's right. That's right. So yeah, you don't definitely don't want to go and hang back out with people if they've not repented. Absolutely. But let's keep going through the scriptures. It says here, verse 18, this is 1 John 3, starting at verse 18. It says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and in truth. That's the key. It says, don't just love with words or speech. You're talking about how you love people. No, what it says is do it with action and with truth. That's very important. And, and then we're going to read a little further because we got to take action on our love. We can't just talk about that we love people. We have to actually <laughs> do something about it. And listen to what it says in verse 11. It says, for this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Okay. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that you have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not remain in death, anyone who does not remain in death. Let me read that again. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Any, um, anyone who does not remain in death. Oh, anyone who does not remains in death. <laughs> there you go. Anyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions, and sees his brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and with truth. So we need to be sharing this message with action and truth to our brothers and sisters that are deceived, that are the ones that don't understand the holy days, that don't understand the commandments, that don't understand the truth, that don't understand baptism for forgiveness of sin, that don't understand what the Bible teaches, that are being led astray by these people that call themselves false apostles and masquerading as apostles of light. We need to teach them the truth, even if it hurts. We need to be teaching it to them because to help them. It says, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our heart condemns us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commandments. That says commands in the Bible, but it actually says commandments if we did a different translation. Very important. So we can ask for anything because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So what pleases the Lord? Keeping his commandments is what pleases him. And then it says, and this is his command to believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. 
The one who keeps God's commands, plural, not one, the Ten Commandments, lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. So honoring the Ten Commandments and honoring his commandments are so important to the Lord. And if we're not being taught the commandments, then we need to ask the question, why? Go ask the minister. Go ask your minister. I dare you. Go ask your minister. How come you never teach on the Ten Commandments, especially the fourth one, the one that says, remember the Sabbath day? I dare you. Everyone watching this video, go ask your minister that tomorrow or the next time you have a church service. Go ask him. How come you never teach on the Ten Commandments? It's a covenant of God. How come you never teach on this? Why? How can we ever teach on the fourth commandment? On the sa remember the Sabbath day by keeping hold. Why? And see what they say. I bet you they will say something like, uh, it's now to the cross. We don't need to do that anymore. Or they'll give you a reason why they won't honor. But the Bible says to teach on it all the time. And I'd be questioning who I'm following. Because who you follow is whose disciple you are. You understand that? Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciple. If you're holding to your minister's teaching, then you're their disciple. If you hold to the Pope's teaching, then you're their disciple. If you're holding to your Bible talk leader's teaching, then you're their disciple. If you hold to your own beliefs and ideas and creations and ideas and theories, then you're your own disciple. You understand? Who you follow, whose teaching you follow, is whose disciple you are. And Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciple, which means there's people that are not really holding to his teaching, and they're not really his disciple. They're masquerading as apostles mm -hmm. of Christ. But the this Lord is, also, very, this but is the, very, very important. The Lord also says that all of us will fall short to his standards. No question about that. Okay. So let's let's keep going. John, first John three. Uh, actually, we just read, no, that. just read that. Yep, just read that. So now we're gonna go down to uh, we need to hold the truth, Philippians. And this is why we need to hold on to the truth. Philippians 3. Philippians 3, starting in verse 3. It says, actually we'll start in verse 1 so we know who he's talking to. Further, my brothers and sisters. Whenever he says my brothers and sisters, we now know he's talking to the body. He's talking to baptized disciples of Jesus. Because if, if you're not baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, then you're not even part of the body. Just so you understand, you listening online, if you have never been baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, if you were just that as an outward sign of inward grace, um, there's no biblical scripture on that, and that means you're probably not part of the body of Christ. But if you have been baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, then that's who he's talking to in scripture. So it says, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again. It is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs those evildoers, those mutilators of flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for such confidence. If someone thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day the people of the people of Israel, a tribe of the, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Wow, that's interesting. If you notice, it's talking about Hebrews of Hebrews. And it's talking about that. Very important. That's a whole other Bible study we'll go through. But see, he was a disciple of Jesus, but he also was from the tribe of Benjamin. Do you know that he didn't call himself a Jew? Because Israelites don't call themselves Jews. Only Jews call themselves Jews. It's a whole nother deception we'll go over another day. People of God are disciples of Jesus and Israelites. The people that call themselves Jews, that's a different, whole different group of people that's deceived the masses. But let's keep reading though. It says, but whatever gained to me, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowledge, Christ Jesus, my Lord, for the sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ 
and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God is based on faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his suffering, becoming like him in death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. So that I have already obtained all this, not that I have already obtained all this, or I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of what which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forget what is behind me and strain what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize, which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Very important to understand which direction you're headed. Are you heading heavenward, Christ Jesus? Because some people don't even believe that they go to heaven. Some people believe when you die, you go to heaven. No, no, there's nobody in scripture that's died and gone to heaven, not, the, not based on the Bible. The Bible says you're asleep until either at the twinkle of life, the last trumpet, or the feast of trumpets, you're raised and go meet Jesus in the air, and you're gone, then the great tribulation comes, or you're beheaded in the middle of the great tribulation, and you die for your faith, then on the day of atonement, then you're resurrected again, or you wait until the thousand years are over, and then everyone is raised, and then the book of life is open and you're judged by your life. How many times have you been taught that in scripture? How many times have a minister taught you that there's three points of salvation? It's not, you just get baptized and you're saved. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> you have to persevere and you better be ready on the Feast of Trumpets. Yeah. You better know what the Feast of Trumpets is. How many of you know, that are watching online even know what the Feast of Trumpets is? If you don't know what that is, you might want to know. You might want to go look at Leviticus 23 and then read all those holy feast days and see that they're the Lord's feast days. And you might want to do some due diligence and start studying them out because if you don't know what they are, how could you possibly be ready? You can't. You'll be just like when Jesus came the first time and he came as the Passover lamb on Passover, not Easter, on Passover, and he became the Passover lamb. Most people didn't recognize him. Right. You know why? Because they weren't honoring his feast days. They didn't know. Just like today. They're not honoring his feast days, so they don't even know when Jesus comes. You know what they say? No man knows the day or the hour. Well, what they don't know, that's a parable, talking to the lost, people that don't know. Parables are talking to people that don't know. I know exactly the day he's coming, because in the scripture he tells us he comes on the Feast of Trumpets. But see, it doesn't matter to you if you don't know what the Feast of Trumpets is, because you won't be ready. So you might want to study that out. And go online and start doing some due diligence. Go to our website at um, youtube.com forward slash saved by truth one and start watching some of those videos. Watch the one called The Hidden Feast. And it'll go through in scripture in detail what all those feast days mean and why they're so important to Jesus. Because they're Jesus' feast days. So that you can be heavenward and be ready on the day he comes. Because the, the saying and the sentence that no man knows the day of the hour is a man-made sentence, not in scripture. It doesn't say that. If you read the whole passage, it says something different and it tells you exactly when he's coming. But most people don't read the Bible. They listen to what their minister tells them. So it's very important that you learn that. Let's keep reading though. Verse 15, all of us then who are mature should take such view of things. And if on some point you think differently that to God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and I'll tell you again, even with tears, many lives of enemies of the cross, many live as the enemies of cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. This is very important who to be careful of. Be careful of people that their mind is set on earthly things. If you're fellowshipping, if you're hanging out with people that all they think about is now, they almost never talk about the Bible. I've tried to get together with so many brothers and study the Bible. It's like, bro, let's get together to study. 
They won't even get together and study the Bible with me. It's like, why? I thought you were supposed to be a disciple of Jesus. And some of them think I'm teaching false doctrine. So you know what I'm saying? Great, then show me the errors of my ways. Let's get together and look at the scripture. Show me. If I'm in sin, if you believe I'm teaching false doctrine, then let's get together and look at the scripture. They won't do it. Why? Because they don't want to see their sin. <laughs> because they don't want to see their sin. Because it points out their sin. Because they're deceitful mm -hmm. workers a lot of the time. Masquerading as apostles of Christ. That's why I'm more than willing. If anybody watching this video, you, you think I'm teaching something that's false, mm -hmm. I'm more than open. Call me. I'll give you my number. Just go on the website, savedbytruth.com. My number's right there. Just call me up. Just call me up. I'm more than happy to study with anyone. I don't care. Minister deacon, elder, you, you name it. Pope, call me up. You want to study the scriptures. I'm all over it. Because the Bible's going to say what the Bible's going to say. But are you willing to do that? Are you willing to look at the scriptures for yourself? Are you willing to look at what the Bible says versus what you've been taught? Because you've got to make sure that you're right with God. Let's keep looking at what the scripture says here. It says, their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly body so we'll be like him in his glorious body. And that's what we're waiting for on the Feast of Trumpets, at the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet. The dead in Christ will rise first. Those who are alive and remain will get caught up to go meet the Lord in the air and we'll be with him forever. Amen. Amen. Let's end it off with a prayer. Father God, I just want to thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much, God, for, for renewing my heart and, and just allowing me to share this message. Father, I pray that it touches the hearts. Um, and I pray that the brothers and sisters that listen to this message are willing to go ask the minister, how come we don't teach them the commandments, God? I pray, they ask, how come we don't talk about the Sabbath day or the, any of the holy days, Father? I pray for all of them to, to really have that conviction to, to look at the Bible and say, what does the Bible say versus what I've been taught? Because he, you've told us who to watch out for, all these deceitful workers. And that's why right now we're in this series of talking about the truth. Uh, because you've said, I tell you the truth so many times, God. And I just want to pray, Father, that all of our hearts, including mine, stay grounded with the truth, um, start uh, really learning and even learning closer and more about what your will is. So we can all make it to the kingdom of God on the Feast of Trumpets when we come. We love you. We thank you so much for this time. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.